mother tells a story of taking her daughter to the park one day. It was a beautiful day. It was sunny, breezy. There were many people there enjoying lunches and uh, enjoying the different activities. She then noticed a homeless man wander into the park. He was thin, unshaven, dressed in ragged clothes, and was carrying a plastic trash bag of his belongings. He stopped at each trash can in the park and rummaged for food. In one can, he found a half of a sandwich, and in another, he found a bag with some potato chips at the bottom. He said, I looked at my daughter and then at the man. I wanted to reach out to help him, but I was hesitant to approach him. Torn by uncertainty, uncertainty, I watched the boy and his mother walk down the sidewalk to a bench near one of those trash cans. The homeless man and I saw the boy place two shiny red apples on the bench. His mother then set an unopened bottle of water beside the apples, and they smiled and walked away. Their gift, freely given, was just waiting to be received. But the homeless man continued to dig through the trash cans. He walked around the bench with the apples in the water, looked at the food, and left it. Uh, if you think about it, many people do that when it comes to Jesus. They ignore him, and they look for meaning and answers to their life in other places. This morning, we are focusing upon the hope of the glorious return of Jesus. Now, of course, when you use the word return, it, it implies to come back again. And that's exactly what Paul says of Jesus in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. I'm going to read it for you now. For the grace of God has appeared. Now, you got that. The grace of God has appeared, bringing to salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. As I mentioned, today we have the privilege of celebrating God's grace as proclaimed in the Lord's Supper. At the center of today's text in Titus 2 implies the grace of God. For the grace of God has already appeared, bringing salvation for all people. At the heart of the gospel lies salvation for all manner of people. In other words, it's not only for Jewish people, it's for uh, Gentile people, it's for Muslim people, it's for all manner of people. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all everyone. At the heart of the gospel lies salvation for all manner of people, and at the heart of salvation lies grace. In fact, the Apostle Paul cannot even think of salvation apart from God's grace. Grace of God is reserved only for those who don't deserve it. Let me say that again. God's grace is only reserved for those who don't deserve it. In fact, that's exactly what Paul says in Romans 11:6. He declares, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. We need to be mindful of the very fact as we walk with Jesus. We are testimonies of grace. Not very long ago, I was talking to someone, and she asked me how she can be sure that she would be able to go to heaven after she died. I told her that she needed to confess that she is a helpless sinner 
who can never be good enough to satisfy the demands of God's holy and perfect law, and that she should not trust in her own righteousness anymore, but she needs to trust in Jesus's righteousness alone for her salvation. She then replied to me, me, a helpless sinner? I'm really not a sinner. I then told her, then you cannot be assured of your salvation since grace is only for sinners. Jesus died only for sinners. I tried to explain to her that no one can live up to God's perfect demands of perfection in the law and how every thought, word, and deed must measure up to that standard and how God must have loved the world by sending his own son and sacrificing him for us. She listened to me and finally said, yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm a good sinner. Yeah, well, I told her I'm a really good sinner too. I'm great at it. God's grace is only for those who can say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God's grace is only for those who can say, Father, forgive me. I know I am proud. I know that there's nothing good within me. I know that I deserve the deepest and darkest pit of hell. And I know that I need Jesus. To me, the most wonderful word in the English language is that five-letter word, grace. It is God's free gift of salvation in Jesus for fallen man. On our part, it's unmerited, undeserved, and certainly unearned. It is by grace alone that we are saved from our sin and the wrath of God. On God's part, it is an act of kindness and love towards sinners. God is not some far removed creator, unable to sympathize with our fallen nature. He is kind and loving. He is the God of all grace. And Paul says that in verse 11, the grace of God has appeared. It has been made manif manifest. It has shown itself. The image here is the shining of a bright light in the midst of darkness. The appearance of God's grace has lit up a world darkened by sin and shame. How has that grace appeared? How has it been manifest or shown itself to us? Grace has been personified in the person and work of Jesus Christ. In mind here is not only the birth of Jesus, but his entire earthly ministry. That grace was especially manifested in Jesus's atoning death. Paul reminds us in verse 14 that Jesus gave himself up for us. He took our punishment on the cross. He suffered the wrath of God as we should have suffered. Laid on him was the guilt of our sins. One of the most powerful stories I know to explain the grace of God is a story about a bridge operator and his son. There was a bridge operator who worked for a train company. His job was a very simple one, but an important one. He would lower the bridge over the river every time a train would pass, and then he would raise it up again for passing boats and for people enjoying themselves on the river. He and his wife had prayed many years for the birth of a child, and finally, after many years, they had been given the gift of a son. He found great pleasure in bringing his son to work every once in a while, and his son grew, and he got prouder and prouder of his son. 
and every time he would watch his father lower the bridge and he would watch that span that would allow the commuter trains to cross over and someday he thought to himself who knows i too can do something like that the people on the train never noticed that each time they crossed that their dad that boy's dad had timed it perfectly so that the train would pass over safely not once were they interrupted from reading the papers or talking to people on the train with them or even gazing at the beautiful surroundings what fascinated the bridge operator's son even more was the powerful machinery full of gears that was just below the tower on which they stood opening a trap door he could see see the gears at work grinding and turning, pushing and pulling, so much work. And yet his father made it look so easy. The sound of an approaching train startled the boy, as well as an unannounced movement of the gears as the father turned on the power to lower the bridge. And the boy fell into the gears and with terror, Running through him, he cried out, Father, Father. Look, today is the third anniversary of my son Jonathan's death. And I have to be perfectly honest with you. What this man did, I don't think I would ever be able to do. The bridge operator looked down in horror and then looked at the train as it was crossing and the train had passed the point of no return. The bridge had to be lowered or the whole train would crash into the river, causing hundreds of deaths. It was his job to lower the bridge to make sure all those people would pass securely. It was his job to save those people. And it was also his job to allow his son to die that day. No one on the train even noticed. They continued to read their papers. They continued to nap. They continued to gaze at the beautiful scenery as this bridge was lowered at the cost of this man's son. Such is grace. That's what the first appearing of Jesus tells us about the grace of God. He, God the Father was willing to sacrifice his only son that we who trust in him may be saved from sin and death and pass over securely and safely into his eternal kingdom. But the appearing of Jesus also gives us a foundation a foundation of hope that Jesus will return. And that's exactly what Paul goes on to say in Titus chapter two, that the grace of God has appeared and it gives us the hope of the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In those words, we have expressed here the hope that motivates us to stand faith, fast in our faith when we are challenged by the temptations of this world. We all know what it's like to fall back into sin. Every one of us has done it, and every one of us will continue to do it until he returns to rescue us. We as Christians, though, are always to be looking in the sky for the arrival of Jesus for when he returns. We're not to take our eyes off of this truth because none of us will know the day nor the hour when he returns. Yes, we must look back. We must also look at our lives here and now and the way we live before a lost and fallen world. 
Paul says in verse 14 that Jesus gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. In other words, Jesus came to liberate us from the bondage of evil which exists in this world and to purify for himself a people who are willing to do that which is good. Now, I know recently there was a uh, rendering of uh, Dr. Doolittle with Eddie Murphy. And I did see it and I did not like it. I always liked the Rex Harrison version of it. And I'm sure many of you remember that one. In that version, there was a wonderful creature called the Push Me Pull You. It had two heads, one on either end. It looked like a llama. And it lived its life always looking in two directions at the same time. It was warm, cuddly, fuzzy, yet it always it seemed to be looking at two different directions. In a sense, we as Christians are asked to be living like a push me, pull you. We live by grace in the death of Jesus on the cross while living in the hope of his glorious return. When he returns, all will be made new. There'll be no more living in a state of pandemonium. There will be no more pandemics. There will be no more riots. There will be no more shootings. There will be no more tears. There will be no more death. Everything will be made new. So how are we to live in the state of the already, already and not yet? Leighton Ford, the one-time pre vice president of the Billy Graham Association, correctly stated it, God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. Whether we are aware of it or not, people are always looking at the church to see what a difference Jesus makes in our lives. So the question is, what do they see? Look at what Paul says about our lifestyle between the already and the not yet. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now listen to this, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live lives self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. It is our spiritual conduct that sets us apart in this world. If you are trying to improve one person by being a good example, you're then improving two. If you try to improve someone without being a good example, then you improve no one. There is always the possibility that our efforts will fail, but there is still the responsibility to reflect Jesus's life-changing power to this world. It will require the ability for us to say no to those things that others in our society are saying yes to. Because of grace, we should take a stand for righteous living while still living in an unrighteous atmosphere. Somebody 
asked me the other day during Bible study about um, falling into that same sin over and over again and having to pray for forgiveness over and over again. I don't think that really glorifies God as much as falling into that sin and then praying to God that he gives us a hatred for that sin. Because if you begin to hate it, you won't be doing it as much. The reason why we continue to fall into that sin so often is because we're still loving it. Paul recognizes this challenge as he wrote to this young pastor, Titus, who pastored a church in a very low morality society called Crete. Being a Christian means being responsible, <coughs> excuse me, for our behavior. Accepting Jesus as our Lord does not make us automatically good, but it does take self-control. We should be the finest examples of self-control. And that's what Paul means in verse 14 when he says, zealous for good works. A compass is a narrow-minded in all that it points to as far as magnetic north. It seems that it is very narrow-minded. A compass is not broad-minded. If it were, all the ships at sea, all the planes in the air would be in grave danger. We should dis discipline ourselves personally to fight any deviation from the course Jesus has set for us. We should not be tolerant of any other course. God's word will always stand as the true compass of our life not the culture of our society. The world may always think of Christians as narrow-minded with our morality, but God will always be pleased with the people who are zealous to obey his word. Yet, we are not to sit back on our laurels in judgment upon society's failures. Instead, we are to express God's word in practical ways. Now, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the peace-loving patron saint of animals, Francis of Assisi. Well, I bet we didn't know that he actually joined the Fifth Crusade in Egypt. That's right, he enlisted himself as a crusader. Although he did not enlist to fight, he risked his life crossing enemy lines to preach to the Muslim Sultan Malik al Kamil. The Sultan did not convert, but he offered Francis riches, which he declined, and then had him escorted back to the Christian camp. When Jesus dwells in our heart, there is actually a desire to do what is right. It is perhaps not as much as self-control as it is God control. There are many things that should not change, even though our culture changes. Ethics, morality are defined by God, and those things never change. Even when authority isn't necessarily Christian, we're still called to obey it as long as they don't tell us to do something that is contrary to the word of God. All authority is given from God. It was given to, un to control the unbridled expressions of sinfulness in this world. It is not to blind or, or make us obey something just for the sake of disciplining ourselves. We do it because we have a love for God and we are zealous for serving him in good works. One day in 1789, the sky of Hartford, Connecticut darkened ominously and some of the representatives glancing out the window 
feared that the end was at hand. Quelling a clamor for immediate adjournment, Colonel Davenport, the Speaker of the Connecticut House of Representatives, rose and said, the day of judgment is either approaching or it's not. If it is not, there's no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish that candles be brought in. Rather than fearing what's to come, we ought to be faithful till Jesus returns. Instead of fearing the dark, we're to be lights as to watch and wait for the appearing of the glorious Savior, Jesus. We are called to challenge one another, to live up to the high standards of our calling in Christ Jesus. Accountability is one of the reasons why being a church family is so important and why we need one another. While we need to love each other, we also need to encourage one another in areas where we may be lacking. Paul wrote to these two young pastors, Timothy and Titus. In his two letters to Timothy, he stressed sound doctrine. In the letters to Titus, he stressed sound duty. It is important for us to realize that as Christians, the world's eyes are always upon us. Therefore, we have an obligation to these people who are looking at us to walk worthy of the calling that Jesus has put upon us. Our lives should reflect the highest duty of good Christian living.